Here's a 2020 Lincoln Navigator that was just purchased. Now it's only got 20,000 miles, but that's totally believable. People trade luxury cars in all the time. But he did have to pay quite a bit for it. He had to pay 67 grand. But with that small amount of mileage, this thing is the luxury edition. It was over $91,000 new. So, I mean, right off the bat, with that little bit of mileage, if you want to get one of these, follow his lead. <laughs> At least get one that's a couple years old. If you're going to save almost $30,000, why not? <laughs> you see, it's a rainy day, but it's slowed down a little. So first, we'll look at the outside. And of course, yeah. You know, it's a beautiful SUV. This is a loaded job. It's got the old little step that opens and closes. Lots of leg room. And as we look at the third row seats, they're real third row seats. The people don't feel like they're cramped in. They can look out the windows when they're sitting there. There's a lot of space in these. And of course, you got your air conditioning on the top, a phenomenal stereo system. Really nice leather seats. You know, opens with a kick of your leg. Now, of course, the trunk is tiny when the seats are back for the three row seats. But, you know, when you flip these things down, you get a lot more room. And like everything, they're electric. Here they go. They're flipping down. <laughs> you don't even have to pull on the things. You know? Of course, that one would go down further if you pull the seat up. But all kinds of space once you empty it down if you want to carry things with this. So we'll put them back up here. Second row isn't powered. Those you have to pull up yourself. <laughs> okay, I got a gripe here. The second rows go down with power, but not up. What's wrong here? Why didn't they make it go the whole way? Hey, you're paying 90 something grand new. <laughs> At least make them go by themselves. Come on now. The old ones are tremendous gas hogs. Yet, he got 22.3 miles a gallon driving here in this big monstrosity because under the hood is the V6 EcoBoost and it's hooked up to that 10 speed automatic transmission that has three overdrives in it. So for a gigantic vehicle like this, that's really good gas mileage. Now, from my experience so far, I bet this one shifts pretty good because it's a 2020. Now, some of the early 10 speeds, they were always hunting for gears. People didn't like them. They weren't happy with them. But we'll see when we road test it, see how it shifts. But from my experience of previous ones, the 2020s didn't have the lag problems that the earlier ones did. So we'll go inside and take a look and hook our computer up. Now, while we're letting this thing hook up here, it's really nice set up. A nice big screen. All kinds of space. And I like this. It's got two armrests, so you don't have to hog it. You get one, and the passenger gets one. And check it out. Look at the back seat. The back seat controls. You got all your own controls back there, too. It's Charlie, it's a luxury vehicle. There's no arguing that. But really, for 90 something thousand dollars, you better get some of this stuff. <laughs> As I said, it doesn't have much. You know, it's got 20,508 miles on it. But we're going to check out with a computer here. Now, her brother who bought the thing, he didn't pay for it. He just went and picked it up. He's got a blue driver. He watches my videos. He did a pretty good inspection of it. So I'm sure it's not a lemon at all. But we're going to go really deep with this to see if anything's a little bit wacky. Because if you remember, I had a guy I bought a very expensive Toyota Sequoia and it turns out that it had been wrecked because the mirror didn't work and I could see the door was a slightly different color and he didn't know that. I figured that out. So let's see what's going to happen here. All right, it reads the VIN number. It knows everything. Navigator, Eco Boost, gas turbocharged, direct injection, 3.5 liter. It's got everything. So we shall do a full analysis of it. We'll do a full scan and here we go. Realize it does have this gigantic sunroof i mean look how far back it goes it's truly panoramic you, know? you want to go hunting comets at night <laughs> see a meteor shower well hey stay in air-conditioned comfort look out the roof everybody can see it except for the people in the third row they're not going to get a very good view they'll have to go outside to look and when it's done 46 systems 46 systems now there's three tiny faults and they'll probably be squirrely things. Let's see what they are. We have occupant classification mode, a crazy communication code with seat controller module, 
Yeah, I see this all the time with all those crazy insane codes. Everything's so computerized. There's so many modules. So we'll just erase that. Of course, we'll check it when we're all done after we road test it. Body control module. It's got a fault too. Gene's doing a bunch of tests by itself now. That's the thing about Fords. There's a lot of, it even beeped the horn. <laughs> There's a lot of automatic testing that this thing could do. And here's the code, crazy communication code. Extra enhanced exterior lighting system code. Well, we'll erase that one too. There's one more image processing module A. Like I said, there's all kinds of modules on this thing. We'll see what that code is. It's doing a bunch of tests, turning things on and off. I wonder if it'll honk the horn this time. It says, vision system camera has a code. We're driving and parking. It's got a little bit of code. Well, we'll do what we did with the other ones. We'll erase it and see if any of them come back after we road test. Now we'll start it up. So we can get some data on the machine for live data. But while we're waiting for that, not only does it have heated and ventilated seats, but it also has a driver's massaging seat. There's the heated seat. There's the air conditioning seat. Same thing on the passenger side. I can feel my butt getting cold. Drive modes. Here we have normal, normal 4x4. Four four. This is a four-wheel drive vehicle. Slippery if it starts sliding outside. Deep conditions, deep snow. You can turn the automatic stop start off. You can turn your parking assist off. An immense amount of technology in this $91,000 car when it was new. But still, with the technology, I gotta say it's laid out pretty well. Look, heated seats, there's your temperature to go up or down for there. Your menu bar's there. So you can play around up here. Gives you all the additional climate controls. Simple, so you can just touch them and make them go. You get tired of it, turn it off. And for those of you like me, who collect everything, kind of like a rat's nest, right? Big old glove box. You can put a bunch of crap in the glove box if you want. You don't see it when it's hidden like that. But now we're gonna look at live data. As you can see, there's an awful lot of it. This is just the computer data here. Calibration data, illegal operation code counter, idle time, all kinds of stuff. And that's just the computer system. Now we'll go into live data for the whole vehicle. There's going to be an awful lot of data flying out at us. This is, after all, an EcoBoost V6 twin turbo gasoline direct inject engine with a 10 speed electronically controlled transmission. There's a lot of computer hardware and software in this baby. A lot of data here. And I do mean a lot of data. We'll start at the top and just to show you how much there is. La, 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 la. We're still in the A's. La, la, la. We're still in the A's. Whoop, 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 whoop. We're still in the A's. We're in the B's now. La, 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 la. And yes, now we're in the D's. Look at that. Look at the information that this thing will throw out to a mechanic. And that's why you can't let any clown work on one of these things. It just keeps going and going and going. Finally, there it is. All of it. And to do a quick review backwards, we'll go super fast. Look at all that info. Whee! That's some obvious things. The equivalent ratio bank one. One is perfect. It's almost there. It's perfect. Now it's a little bit off. 1.99. Pretty close. And the other side, bank two is the same thing. One is perfect. 101. So it's running pretty well perfect. These modern cars, you actually get the fuel pressure on the machine. You don't have to hook up a cage. Information on the grill shutter. These have grills in the front of the car that will open for more efficiency, close to warm them up more. I mean, these are extremely complex systems and anybody who works on has got to be able to get this data if they break. Hot wastegate eight, servo compensation strategy. Power is reduced to prevent overheating. No, because it's not overheating. Tests are done for the injectors. No fault in any of them, all the way down to six. Information on the variable timing on the intake and the exhaust camshaft. The fuel pressure is almost perfect. The low side fuel pressure desired is 486, and that's 490, 480. That's really close. You know? I could spend a few months explaining all this stuff, but I'm just showing you. It's phenomenally interesting, all the technology that's in these things. Which is one reason I tell people, if you buy one of these things, make sure you keep full insurance. You get in a wreck. It's going to cost a fortune to repair all this computer stuff. Do not drive one of these unless you have full insurance, because it'll just blow your mind what it can cost to repair one of these if it gets in a wreck and the electronic systems start to get crumpled and start shorting each other out but let's take it for a spin and see how it runs it's all buttons now so you push your reverse and you can see you get all kinds of views there's the backup camera but next to it you got a side camera you can play with that too 
but it's real handy so you don't run into things. You can see our pole. We're going by the pole. There's the pole. As you can see, it's got a pretty good heads up. Shows how fast you're going right in front. Mileage of gas that's left, temperature outside, the time. Hey, he's got it in four wheel high, so I don't want four wheel. Switch it back to normal here. Now it's just normal. Get a little bit better gas mileage too. High riding vehicles got a good ride. I mean, it's big, heavy, large vehicles, so they're gonna take the bumps better. I do have to say, we're driving at a slow speed because there's a turtle in front of us. And at this speed, when I cruise a little, it can feel a little kind of hunting for gear in the transmission. I can still feel it in this 10 speed. It is a 2020. I've been in the new ones and they are a bit better than this. Now, if I switched it into a different mode, we'll see what happens. Let's we'll switch it to 4x4 four four and see what happens. Well, now the hunting is gone. It's not doing the hunting. Often when you shift the modes, the hunting will go away. 4x4 four four has got a little bit stiffer to it. Now, since it's raining, let's put it on slippery. See how that does. It's not slipping. And it's not hesitating either. Let's see if it really works on a wet, slippery day. Well, there's nobody behind us that I can see yet, so here we go. Is it sliding? No, it's not sliding. And it's accelerating quite well. I gotta say, the system works quite well. Now, you can see we're going like 56 now. We'll see what passing is like. It's getting up and going pretty good and it isn't sliding at all in this rain and now we caught up to the turtle that was in front of us right up there so i gotta slow down now i got no choice <laughs> but i do have to say i'm impressed now this is auto stop start which you can turn off now it tells you it's been deactivated but interestingly enough when i have it in the slippery driving condition it didn't shut itself off so i guess when it's slippery they don't want to shut it off to keep start and stopping which of course would be more dangerous the funny thing watch now we're on a single yellow with dots on the side and then it warned us it's vibrating the steering wheel but it didn't do it over a double yellow line obviously the software isn't that great hey a double yellow line is more dangerous than a single yellow line yet it only did the vibrate and warning with the single not with the double because as you can see here there's the single one again and it makes the red light and it makes the steering wheel vibrate but it didn't work with a double and that's weird slippery four-wheel drive automatic works good we got a twin turbo here we step on it in the rain it's not slipping or sliding and it's also not really losing the acceleration it's still really quick i gotta say that system's working really well but now see there we go double yellow line and it didn't wobble it it just doesn't work on a double yellow line maybe that's something to do with the rain and hard i don't know i just say i would never trust my life to one of those systems Keep your eye on the road, keep your hands on the wheel. A really luxurious SUV. Now, 91 grand, 60 something's much better, if you ask me. But it doesn't have that many miles on it. You got a lot of bells and whistles at a level of complexity, as you saw with my scan tool, that would blow your socks off. So, make sure you keep insurance on the thing, because if you get in a wreck, all that electronics is going to cost a fortune to fix if the wiring gets bent and backed up. We got a 2019 Dodge Ram with a big Hemi engine. The guy's got a noise. He wants me to fix. He says all these guys he took it to the mechanics. They don't know what it is. So we're going to figure that out. And we'll also show you, has this Ram truck held up? Has it had any problems? What could go wrong? And what you'd do if you bought one to make it last as long as possible. We're really lucky on this one. A lot of times, it'll only make the noise at certain times. If you're turning the wheel going 80 miles an hour or going uphill this one does it right here as you can see there it is no it's not the barking dogs in the backyard it's the clicking noise now we're lucky here headphones will work great with an electronic stethoscope these things don't cost much this one was made in china works perfectly fine although i do have to say i put quality headphones on it came with really cheap ones that weren't worth crap so i got nice headphones so i can hear it a lot better so all we got to do is stick it on it as he pushes it up and down okay start pushing now we'll put our headphones here you can really hear it now it's coming off of the upper control arm here but sounds can sometimes travel so i'm gonna go to under i'm gonna listen to it on the bottom side too now unfortunately the noise is going through the entire control arm system 
It's also loud at the bottom, so we're gonna take this tire off. Now first, we'll see if it has any play. No play there. No play here. There's nothing wrong with wheel bearing, tie rods, so I'm going to take the wheel off. I found these electric impact ones, this Porter Cable one wasn't too expensive. There we go. So I'll get the wheel off. Now as you can see there's no play, but it's definitely making a noise. Now of course it won't make the noise now because it's up in the air, but these things are notorious for ball joints and parts wearing out, and the only way they're going to make a noise is if they're loaded. So if you get a long pry bar, start prying. Ha-ha! <laughs> okay, you heard the doing? The spring on the shock is what's making the noise. Now, what I'm going to do is, I've got WD-40. We'll spray a bunch around it while it's up, and it might quiet it down for quite some time. We're going to check the rest of it because I learned from my old man years ago. You find one thing, don't think that's the only thing. You got to check everything. For example, we fixed a lot of flat tires back in the garage. My father say, don't stop just because you found a nail. Put it in the bath of water and see if anything else bubbles because it might have two nails or three nails, right? We're going to check the rest of it, but that doing noise is the spring. And it's been doing it for a year, he said. Guys couldn't figure out what it was. Well, the tire's evenly worn, so there's no real suspension problem, because then there could be cupped wear on the inside or outside. This is a perfectly smoothly worn tire. When they make these things, these springs are just somewhat cheaply made, and they have a tendency of making noise when you push on the car. You can get lower ball joints doing it, so we're going to check the lower ball joint here. Again, we pry on it. You can see it's solid as hell. If this ball joint was worn, when I pulled on it, it would clunk here because it would have play. And only the weight of the vehicle is going to do that when they start to wear. When they're actually physically worn, you'll see the boot is ripped, the grease will leak out. Then you know it's dry and that's a problem. But in this case, it's just the stupid spring making a noise as you push on it. It's compressed and it's making a noise where the spring hits the inside of the shock. You can see it's dry as a bone if it was leaking fluid and was bad. You'd see fluid, but you can see it's bone dry. I mean, it's only got 30,000 miles on it, but it's making that noise because as it moves, the spring has to compress, and as it does, it's rubbing down inside and making a noise. So you can see here, we're gonna check everything else, but there's no play here, there's no play here. It's just a stupid spring boring. And really, the way these spring assemblies are made, you basically have to buy the whole stupid thing, and it rides fine. We're going to spray it a little. You could use that AT205 reseal I have, but I ran out. Especially where the spring contacts the bottom and the top. Let's check everything else. All the bushings are fine. They're not torn. Tie rod's fine. Power steering bellows is fine. Everything else is fine. It's just that annoying little clunk that he gets where this is rubbing. So we got the wheel back on. We'll let it soak a little to work its way in. We'll check out this 2019 Ram. We'll get under the hood. It's got a really nice interior, I mean. Black and chrome, my favorite. Dual sunroof. Plenty of room in the back seat. A lot of power, lots of all the things that people generally want. Really comfy back seat stuff. I gotta say. These back seats are more comfortable than the Fords. And it's a short bed. It's a show truck. But underneath, this is a mild hybrid. If you're curious about them, here's how it works. A V8 engine, of course. It's a 5.7 liter Hemi. But as you can see, it's got this strange device on the top. Okay? That's the electric motor that helps drive the engine to give it more power. You can see. It uses the giant belt to help drive the crank to make it spin faster. Now, unfortunately, that motor's made in Italy, but that's another story. This was Fiat Chrysler when it was made, even says so. FCA, Fiat Chrysler, on a door, but it was put together in the United States. Now, it's all around gas mileage is about 18. You can see, if you know anything about Ram trucks, that's better than a Hemi is going to get by itself. But of course, it's not phenomenal gas mileage by any stretch of the imagination. One, it's a mild hybrid, just a boost type setup. And two, it's a big, heavy truck with a giant V8 engine. It's going to use up gasoline. Behind the back seat, you really can't access it. There is a hybrid battery that operates that system. This hybrid system has a stop and start like other vehicles, which I can't personally stand. But this is a better system because 
it's not using a starter motor to stop start stop start it's using this electric booster motor to spin the engine it is a better system when it comes to that they're still you know they're not going to get great gas mileage it doesn't matter what you do to these things uh, they're going to make an electric one and then of course it gets no gas mileage it runs on electricity they try to make comps and all that but uh, who knows how that's going to pan out this is kind of like hey, a little stop gap to get better gas mileage out of a v8 engine and a little bit more power but really when you consider the power one of these v8s has in the first place some of it is a little bit overkill now this motor doesn't create too much horsepower but it does give 130 pound feet of extra torque for takeoff and of course if you are going to tow which he doesn't <laughs> it can do 12,700 pounds of towing electric motors have instant torque so when you're pulling a load this makes a big difference it doesn't change the gas mileage all that much but it adds a lot of torque not all that much horsepower but really this thing's got enough horsepower already you got a boat you're not going to get stuck on the ramp of course with the v8 engine you're not going to get stuck on the ramp anyway so like i say some of this is a little technological overkill now he's only got 30,000 miles on this thing and nothing's broken on it yet so we can't talk about the long life of this italian motor yet uh, we'll find out as time goes on but like i said it's kind of a little bit of overkill and that electric motor does have an 80,000 mile warranty on it so you got 80,000 mile warranty on it <laughs> in case it breaks between now and then they can put another Italian one back in <laughs> just realize this the hybrid battery replacement is like 2,500 bucks so it's not like your little battery here which it also has which costs you a hundred something bucks easy to put it in no it costs a lot of money if that hybrid battery goes out you got to ask yourself if you're going to buy one are you going to mess with this mild hybrid or are you just going to go traditional and just realize one thing if you go traditional it's true for all these Hemi 5.7 v8s the late model ones like this they have upgraded horsepower but they did so by moving the cam they moved the cam up higher it used to be the splash of the crankshaft oil splashed on the camshaft lubricated it if you just idle all the time in these things it doesn't splash on the new ones because they moved the cam up higher to get more horsepower some engineering design the engineers didn't realize or maybe they thought they did they're laughing their asses off i don't know now the crank won't splash all the way to the cam when you're idling doesn't lubricate it and then you hear a lot of these hemis having the hemi tick and they got the tick because the cam and the lifters are worn that's a very expensive replacement if you own one of these don't pretend you're one of those policemen sitting and having a cup of coffee idling your engine all day watching things turn it off don't do extended idling in one of these i've got customers with them that never did extended idling 150 they still don't burn oil they're quiet they don't make any noise but the guys who idle all the time the engines do get noise and they will wear out faster so keep that in mind don't buy one of these if you're going to idle if you really got a vehicle and you're going to idle all the time you're better off buying a diesel anyway because the diesels are made to idle all day long they'll run on hardly any fuel at all and you'd be much happier with the diesel vehicle if you're going to sit and idle all the Time. let's close the hood and take it for a ride see it's got a big screen a really nice backup camera i gotta say it's very realistic looking it's a nice backup setup the transmission ship's fine because it's only got 30,000 miles it's got serious power knockoffs big old armrest drink holders it's well thought out it does have a very smooth power band there's no arguing that and with that extra torque it take off a lot faster and this is a conventional two-wheel drive truck he's not even towing with this thing it's a show truck so two-wheel drive is fine start on a little drag strip and we'll see what this boosted system can do with a mild hybrid on your mark get set go well the wheels are spinning <laughs> It's got that satisfying V8 noise and plenty of pickup. The cars are whizzing by. Now I can feel that the mild hybrid does give that 130 pound feet of extra torque on takeoff. It takes off very smoothly. There's no arguing that. There's a lot of technology, like I said, and it is an Italian electric motor. <laughs> Realize that, but it does work. The man wasn't lying. It's getting 18.1 uh, miles a gallon, even though we're driving like maniacs. Now, prior to this, he had a normal V8 Hemi Ram, and he'd get 15, 16. 
So he's getting like two miles a gallon better gas miles. It does work, but it's not really the gas mileage. It's the torque that counts because of course on the highway, it isn't going to make any difference because you're just driving down the road. It's the acceleration and the deceleration that's going to change. On the highway, you're just running down the road. So it really doesn't make any difference now. Now it shut itself off and turned itself on. You couldn't even feel the difference. I do have to say, even though it's Italian motor, it's very smooth. You couldn't feel it shutting off, and you couldn't feel it taking off either. It was just like it was a normal engine idling, but the engine was shut off, then that electric boost motor turned it back on, and there wasn't any lag. You couldn't feel any difference as if you were in a normally idling V8 engine. Now, the one thing the owner says, even though he's had it for two years, he bought it used, he's still not used to the regenerative braking because it's a mild hybrid, it regenerates some electricity, not all that much electricity, but some. And he still doesn't get used to the feel. And that's something that you really have to get used to. Now, this isn't bad. If you get in a Tesla, a lot of them, you take your foot off the gas, it'll come to a stop by itself. And that freaks me out anytime I get in one and drive one. This isn't like that, but you're still gonna get a different feel. You gotta get used to that. So the owner who was originally worried about it turning on, shutting off, and feeling weird, this really, you don't feel it. Now it's only got 30,000 miles. We don't know what the future will bring with an Italian motor. Here we have a 2013 Chrysler 200. Making noises, check engine lights coming on. We'll find out what's wrong, but first, let's do an overview of Chrysler 200. What went wrong? Now, they only sold them for seven years. They were competing against things like the Toyota Camry. Now, back in 2013, when this V6 Chrysler 200 was new, it was only about $2,000 cheaper than a V6 Toyota Camry. And if you compared this V6 200 to a four-cylinder Camry back in the day, the four-cylinder Camry was only $200 more than this car. Which leads me to wonder why anybody would even bought one in the first First place. You get the legendary Toyota reliability for $200 more with a four cylinder and $2,000 more with a V6. Let's see what's under the hood of this thing. This is calling their world engines. 3.6 liter variable valve timing six cylinder engine. There it is. Since Fiat took over Chrysler, there's a lot of Italian design going on in some of these things. Maserati and Ferrari souped some of these up to put out a lot of horsepower. Not exactly known for reliability Ferrari and Maserati, right? This particular one puts out 283 horsepower. Being a world car, guess where this particular one was made? Well, this engine was made in Mexico. They got three plants, two are in Michigan and one's in Mexico. This says the Mexican engine. Again, not a place where high quality is known. But some of these engines, especially these earlier ones, had a problem with the heads and the valve seats and they had to be rebuilt. Now, they only made the 200 for seven years. They suckered a bunch of people in the beginning, but the last year, they sold in the United States 2017 they only sold about 18,000 of them you can see the sales <clears throat> probably as people drove and the engine didn't work right they saw they were typical Chrysler poorly made junk and they couldn't give the things away so they stopped making them when you're competing against greats like Toyota Camry Honda Accord it amazes me that they actually sold 700 something thousand of these total in the United States. Well, we'll plug in the old scan tool and see what it says. It says PO520, engine oil pressure sensor circuit. Repair immediately if it runs bad. And it also has engine oil pressure sensor circuit low. Let's pray it's a simple fix. This is the oil pressure sending unit for this car. Now, unfortunately, in this horrible world design, I guess if that's the way the world was going, then the world is in horrible shape. That little sensor isn't big. But it's hiding under here. You got to take the whole top of the engine apart to get to it. Let's compare that to my 94 Celica. Now it is 19 years older than that car. You can change the oil sending unit on this in 15 minutes. It may be 19 years older. It still has the original one because it's still working. That shows you Toyota quality versus Chrysler crap. Now as you look under the car, you can see there's no oil dripping. It's not dangerous. If it was leaking, you could get low oil pressure. That's dangerous. If you actually had low oil pressure, of course that would be dangerous too, but let's start it up here. It's not like the engine has rods knocking. If you actually lost oil pressure, the engine would sound horrible. And this one sounds totally normal for one of these that's got about 90,000 miles on it. So in this case, the only thing that's wrong is 
the warning system that warns you when the oil pressure has gone too low is broken. So you're going to have to take this engine apart and spend hundreds of dollars replacing the warning device. Like I say, it's not making noise, it's not leaking, it's not like it's going to be a problem for the time being. But your check engine light's going to stay on. You can't get your car inspected if you live where cars inspected. So eventually, you'd have to take the engine apart and replace the stupid little poorly made piece of metal and plastic so that the check engine light will go out. But luckily for the owner, this is Clarksville, Tennessee. They don't do that kind of inspection on cars. So he can just merrily drive along this way if he wants. If you don't want to spend a bunch of money taking the engine apart to replace a stupid warning device that is broken. Well, let's check the OEM enhanced data. Well, it still just shows the stupid one for the oil pressure sensor circuit. So let's look at live data. We're seeing the short term fuel trim on bank one that's subtracting 3.9% and the short term fuel trim on bank two subtracting at zero minus 3.1 minus 3.5 on one so it's running a little bit uneven it's subtracting more fuel on bank one than on bank two i can feel a little jiggle in the engine but that's normal with these things they aren't perfectly made after all they are made in mexico they don't hold up over time like a toyota engine would all right let's do an all module scan here we go it's going through all the modules as you can see it goes through an awful lot of stuff they did load these things with a lot of electronics and if you know anything about chrysler's as they age their electronics tend to go bonkers and have all kinds of wacky problems but luckily for this other than oil pressure sending unit not working right electronically the only code is b16 5e which is the parking lamp control circuit is open on these electronic monstrosities even the parking lights are controlled by computers but in the case of this one i turned it on checked them all they're all working presently so it's another thing you live with when you have a chrysler that's starting to age now as i said they're nice looking cars they got nice looking interiors and everything chrysler was always form over function as my grandfather always said he was a mechanic too chrysler's the good looking cars but they just don't hold up over time and realize this was long before mercedes benz bought them and then sold them and then fiat bought them and then peugeot mixed it all together and calls it stellantis as far as i'm concerned time goes on with chrysler quality goes down and this v6 pentastar world engine made in mexico it's no exception look at all the plastic crap on it the plastic oil pressure sender is now broken we gotta take all that apart to replace it if we want the light to go out and look at the overall car they are nice looking cars they got style there's no arguing that. But in the case of these Chrysler 200s, ultimately function one over form. They went from selling 170 something thousand to only selling 17,000 the last year. They don't sell them at all anymore. Now originally when they brought this out they had that big Super Bowl ad where I believe it was Eminem is riding down down Detroit and they're bragging about oh it's American made blah blah America America. They always seem to do that in Super Bowl ads right. But they picked the 200 and not the Chrysler 300. The 200 is made or I should say assembled in Michigan. Again. This engine came from Mexico, but the vehicle was assembled in Michigan. But the 300s at the time were all made in Canada. So they decided, well, we'll show the 200, which is kind of a mistake because the 300s are at least fast and zippy and they could hold up a little, but the 200s, whew, they just failed miserably. So I guess I'll put the beauty cover back on. I know what a stupid idea that is. The beauty cover serves no purpose other than to hide the engine. I guess they didn't want people to see all that plastic crap on the engine. So they covered it up with another piece of plastic crap. <laughs> so if you never want to miss another one of my new car repair videos, remember to ring that bell.